And I know for some of our high schoolers, you might be thinking, well, do I get to go on this trip? Well, it's open from senior in high school and up. So uh, yeah, if you're a senior in high school and you're interested in taking this trip with us, come to the meeting. We'd love to have you be a part of it. Um, so I went to Uganda, and first let me start by apologizing that I, I didn't announce it to the church. And I'm, I'm just going to be really upfront about why. I was having a hard time kind of connecting this trip. I was doing a lead team trip. I was training pa pastors as part of our Vision for the Valley thing that we've been doing. And I was having a hard time connecting. What would this be for us as the body? And, you know, um, honestly, I, I, I robbed you of the joy of being able to at least pray for me and be able to pray for our trip and pray for those guys that were on the trip. And so I, I, I apologize to you for that. I mean, it is prayer month, after all. We should be praying. And, um, and so I, I didn't bring it because I was really just like, okay, how do I connect the bridge to this? But God did some amazing things. And so, of course, when you go to Africa, you expect to see uh, animals. You know, you're like, okay, I wonder what kind of animals I'm going to see and all that. Well, I got to see some animals that are that is really cool. Uh, as we were driving along, uh, just going out to Gulu, uh, we got to see baboons that were like right on the side of the road. Uh, our guy that was driving just pulls right over. He rolls down the window. He's like, take a picture. I'm like, yes, sir. Yeah, the picture. <laughs> I got baboons. Uh, I got photos of that. Uh, we pulled out of the mall uh, on our last day as we we're getting ready to head back to the airport. We stopped at the mall and just had a quick bite to eat, and as we're pulling out, like we pass this open lot, and there's all these trees and stuff, but there's monkeys everywhere, and you're just like, there's monkeys at the mall. It's like, you know, it's just, it was just, you, it's weird, you know, you just kind of, you just didn't expect to see it, but that, you know, got, got to see that, and just all kinds of different things, and um, so that was pretty cool. City driving was, was chaos and crazy, um, so you know, they just drive, and, and Stu was giving, Stu Dix was the pastor of Village Church, was on the trip with us, and he kept giving our driver a hard time, because he said, they drive uh, on the left side, and he said, you guys drive on the wrong side of the road. He said, no, we drive on the right side. He said, no, you don't, you drive on the left. We drive on the right side. You guys are driving on the wrong side, and he kept giving them a hard time, you know. Well, as they drive, it's just chaos. Cars and motorcycles everywhere. Motorcycles don't count, just the cars do. So motorcycles are zipping in and out between everybody, and they're just going. It's just craziness, you know? And so the guys are like, Rob, it's your first time in Africa. You get to sit in the front with the guy, you know? And, and what that really meant was this. We're going to sit in the back, stretch out, and just catch, a, catch some sleep, right? You get to have a panic attack for the next hour and a half while we're going through the city. Um, you know, you get to sit right up front. So I got to experience that. So that was, that was cool, and that was uh, quite interesting in itself. Um, it was the dry season. Uh, weather for us was blessed. It, we did not have to sleep in our sweat overnight or anything like that. It was 60s at night with the windows open. It was awesome. Uh, the highest we got was mid-90s. We had a literal 100-degree uh, swing coming back to the States. So we were in the 90s, and it was negative when we landed. So, you know, so it did have to deal with that. But it was beautiful weather the whole week. But it was their dry season or getting into their dry season. So I got to see them making all kinds of bricks and stuff. So this was the time of the year when people would kind of shift from working to now doing home restoration and fixing their homes and fixing their roofs and doing all the stuff they had to do uh, because they could. And so I got to see all of that as we drove, drove through, and that was, that was pretty cool. So all kinds of hut villages as we got off the main road. We're going to Gulu. You just see these paths off of this main road or off of this dirt road, but that was the main road. And it just led to little uh, hut villages that would just pop up as you're going. And so I got to see uh, where a lot of people just out, out there lived. And, and there's thousands of these little hut villages and people all around the Gulu area where we were. But I think the thing that really stood out the most to me, um, as well as the ministry with the pastors, but the, the thing that I saw that just really struck me uh, was the Nile River. So we got to see the Nile. And so the part where we were, there's all these rapids, and it was just, it was, it was quite impressive. And, you know, we were at one hotel at one point, and we got, to, I saw this little pamphlet for whitewater rafting on the Nile. I was like, ha, ha, no, I'm not doing that. And, you know, like, I was seeing just where we were, and they're like, oh, yeah, that's like a, a, a small part. Like, that's not a big deal. And I'm like, that's not a big deal. Like, I don't want to see the other parts. But it was quite impressive to see the Nile. And what really stuck at, uh, stood out to me was, before I left, um, 
and Josh was getting ready to preach, Josh Bell, I told him, I said, hey, I don't know what you may do or not do for that Sunday, but that is Sanctity of Life Sunday. And if you were following the news, we had the March for Life that was in the news, and President Trump spoke of that and all that. But, but, so that's what we were thinking about here in the States, and that was on my mind. And I saw the Nile River there, and Genesis came to my mind. In the book of Genesis, it says, when the Israelites grew in number, when they were in exile, the Egyptians became fearful of them. And Pharaoh became so fearful that the Israelites would grow in number that they would overthrow Egypt. And so he made a decree. He said, every male born needs to be thrown into the Nile. And just the picture of that, seeing that river and just the loss of life, the destruction of life, just throw the males into that river. And it, was just, it just struck me. And when we were in our classes, we asked some of the men about, you know, what were some of the stories of your culture and some of the things. And we got to hear the story of Uganda from one of these guys. And the story of Uganda is about two brothers. It sounds pretty familiar, right? Cain and Abel in the Bible, two brothers. Well, it's very similar. And he said, well, there's these two brothers. And one wants to go hunting. And he really liked his other brother's spear. So maybe you've experienced something like that where you've taken your brother's gun to go hunting or maybe his fishing pole and you weren't supposed to, you know? Well, that's kind of this story. The one brother's like, I really like my brother's spear. It's a great spear. So he takes his spear without asking, goes hunting. And so then he spears an elephant. And I'm sitting there thinking, what in the world are you thinking? Like, that's going to do a whole lot. That little, got the elephant. So he spears an elephant and what happens? Well, the thing runs off. Into the, into the forest with the spear still in it. So the guy comes home and he tells his brother, hey, I, I lost your spear. He says, no, I want my spear back. And don't you come back here until you have my spear. Not just any spear, but my spear. And so the guy goes off looking for, his, looking for the elephant and looking for this spear and he gets to the Nile and he meets this woman at the Nile and she says, I have these beads. If you throw the beads into the Nile, the spear will come up in the water and you can take it back to your brother. So he does. And the spear appears, right? So he throws in the bees, he gets the spear, and he goes back. So he's at his brother's house, and while he's there, he, he gives the spear back to his brother, and he shows his niece the beads that the woman gave, and he's telling the story about how he got the spear. Well, his niece, the niece in the story is just a little, a little girl, and she eats the beads while he's talking with his brother. And he looks at the little girl, and he looks at his brother, and he says, well, you got your spear back. I want my beads back. And so the brother's looking at him like, well, what do we do? And he says, well, if you won't give them to me, I'll take them myself. And he kills the niece and takes the beads out of her. And the brother at that point, you know, says, we're done. He kills an animal, throws it into the Nile and says, you have to live on that side. Don't ever come back. We're done. Right? And that's the story. And they're like, that's it. That's Uganda. They're like tribes that just, there's anger and division and loss of life and death. And there's just all of this happening. That's our story. And it just struck me like this, there's just this, this death that reigns in, in humanity. Even there in Uganda, there's this loss of life. There's not a sanctity of life. Well, that gets us to our, our teaching time with these men, these pastors. So I was there teaching pastors. We had a big group. And in that group of pastors, we had six tribes represented. Six tribes. These men are eating together. They're laughing together. They're hanging out together. They're praying together. They're worshiping together. They're just there as brothers. And what was it? It was reconciliation in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what brought them back together. That's what gave you. And these men now love each other. Even though the tribes they come from, some of them still fight each other and still hate each other. These men had unity and love for one another and they were together. And I'm, I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, the only thing that gives us hope is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The God of life brings it back to what it should be. And so, I saw this in these pastors, this, this, the gospel just playing out in their lives together. Just, they had unity 
and that true reconciliation, true racial reconciliation, true sanctity of life, it all finds its, itself in the gospel of Jesus. And so, I have a lot of other stories, you know, things like what you should not eat <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, but what I want to do is I want to take a moment right now. I'm going to ask that you guys pray for these pastors. Some of them are going to be taking the gospel that we were teaching to some really hard areas. Some of them are heading back towards South Sudan. And so there's a lot of refugees coming out of South Sudan right now. There's a lot of fighting in South Sudan. And so what's happening is the refugees are coming into Uganda. And so what are they doing? They said, we have to take the gospel there. We have to share this gospel with these people. Now, in doing that, some of these men could lose their life. There's that much animosity. They could go and share this gospel of hope and gospel of reconciliation with them, and they could lose their life in doing so. But to them, it's, it's worth it. We, we need to do this. We need to share this because they said the great peace is coming. And what they meant by that is the fighting one day is going to stop. It will probably stop sooner than we expect, and people will go home. And they said, so we need to get the gospel to them while they're here, while we have access to them. And we need to share this gospel of Jesus with them so when they go home, the gospel will make a way through South Sudan. And that's how they're, they're thinking. Gospel will make a way. We just need to go share it. So these men are going to go and share. They were very thankful for the time that they were with us. We taught two hours, had breakfast, taught two more hours, had lunch, taught two more hours, called it a day in a room that was hot and stuffy, you know, even though it's in the 90s and nice, if you don't have a breeze, it gets a little hard to sit in the classroom setting. But these guys, they were there to, to learn the scriptures, to, to be equipped and to be trained. And I tell you, at the end of those sessions, it was amazing because we get to the end of those sessions and someone would say, we just need to praise God for his faithfulness. We need to praise God for this truth that we're hearing right now. And so then they would all stand up and somebody would say, who has a song about God's faithfulness? One of the guys was like, I have a song and it goes like this. And then they would all just start singing. And this, as they were singing, they're just they're banging on the tables and they're just with, and clapping hands and they're just singing praises to God for his faithfulness and his goodness and whatever we were just learning about in that lesson. And I'm just standing there listening to these guys singing in Anatoly and in English and, and just amazed by it all. And then at the end, they just start praying. At the end, they, they finish the song, and then you just hear a cacophony of this voice. It's just, God, you're so good. Just, uh, just praising him for who he is. And then one voice would just raise above the others and, and just close that time in prayer. And it was just an amazing, powerful thing. So these men, they're taking the gospel to go to others who need it. And we're going to be talking about that today as we look in our passage of Philippians. So, uh, in, so in just a moment, we're going to ask that we pray for these men. And that we would also pray for the sanctity of human life. Life is precious. And our God is the God of the living. Our God is the God who raises the dead, who brings us back through the gospel of Jesus Christ. While we were sinners and we were dead in sin, he brings us back to life and to himself. He reconciles us. He is not the God of death. He is the God of life. And so life is precious to us because that is our God. And so those two things I'd ask for you to pray for in just a few minutes. So uh, we'll have a little bit of guitar just in the background. If you want to pray where you are by yourself, or if you want to pray, I would say pray with those around you. Pray for these pastors and what God will do in, in, in their ministries. And then also pray for the sanctity of human life in our culture, but in all the world. It's not just here in the States. It's all over the world that death is reigning where life should be reigning. So let's pray.
God of life. You have made us born again through Christ Jesus and his sacrifice for sin at the cross. And you've made us whole and you've given us new life, a new birth. You're the God of the living. And Father, we, we want to take a moment and pray for these pastors in Uganda who will be taking the gospel to, to those around them who are in darkness, who are living in a world that is broken and crooked and twisted where death reigns and there's hatred and anger and division and strife and they bring the gospel of peace God we pray for much fruit much power in the spirit we pray God that they would have doors open to them that you would make their paths straight that they would have opportunities to take this gospel of hope to those around them, that they would see their country change and they would see the world change. Father, give them strength. Give them steadfastness. Give them words to speak. Give them compassion and mercy. Give them all that is lacking in Christ and fill it up and overflow it. Father, we pray for life. We think about human life. David says that you knew us in the secret place. You formed us in our mother's womb. You knew the days ahead of us before there was yet one. You are the God of the living. You breathe life. And this world is bent on destruction and death and sin reigns. And God, we pray that you would intervene sovereign God of the universe, would you intervene? Because we know the greatest hope is the gospel, but we also know, God, that not everyone will receive it. Not everyone will be reconciled. Not everyone will have their lives transformed, their hearts changed. So, God, would you intercede? Would you move and protect life? May we as your people be moved to step in, be the hands and feet of Jesus care for life in all different manners and ways. Show us how we can be a part of that. Holy Spirit, show us what we can do personally to be working towards the preservation of life. And God, now as we worship in the Word, we ask that you would be glorified. That that you would just work through me, you work through this passage, that we would see you, Lord Jesus, that we would be transformed by it, and that you'd help us reflect you more to this world. That we would be shining bright as stars in this world around us, as, as we will read in this passage. Help us to see what that means. How to reflect Jesus so that we shine brightly. And we worship in the name of Jesus. Amen. We are in Philippians uh, chapter 2 uh, today, and we'll be looking at verses 12 through 18. And we're in this series on Philippians, and we're not going verse by verse all the way through, but we're going through these sections, and, and so the, what we're looking at is this theme of reflecting Jesus in our daily lives. What does that look like to reflect Christ to those around us, to live like Christ would have us to live? You know, how, what's the application really is what we're looking at here as we go through the book of Philippians. And so if you would open your Bible to Philippians chapter 2, uh, we'll go through verses 12 through 18. And, and as you're doing that, um, there was a, this two things that, that struck my mind as I was praying. One is what a blessing it was to impart the gift that God had given to me. Just what, what little I had, these men were willing to receive it and be blessed by it. And and each and every one of you has a gift imparted to you. God, in Christ, as you have come to him and been saved, he's worked in your life, transformed your life, and he is imparting a good gift into you. There's something that you can share with those around you, something that they, they could receive that would help them grow in grace and walk more uh, intimately with their Savior. And so you had an opportunity, actually, afforded to you, as Stephanie shared about Brazil, what is your gift? What is that 
thing that has been imparted to you that you could share with others. Uh, not just in Brazil, but even here. And the other thing that struck me, and we'll save it for my sermon. It'll fit in. It's a good spot. It'll be a great illustration. So, Philippians chapter 2, 12 through 18. <clears throat> Would you read with me? This is Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, starting in verse 12. <clears throat> Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, <clears throat> excuse me, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. This is God's word for us. There's a few phrases that I'm just going to look at today. There's a lot to go through here. So um, if you're in a community group or 3D group, this would be a great passage to go back to and just kind of unpack it some more. But I'm just going to pick out three phrases that come through this uh, couple of paragraphs. And we're just going to look at those and, and see what that means for us as far as reflecting Jesus in our day to day. Um, the first phrase that stands out to me is in verse 12. So in verse 12, it starts like this, Therefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. Here's the phrase, and I would underline this in my Bible, uh, but you may not want to do that. You might want to write it down, or you might want to underline it. I don't know what you do, but I underline it in mine. It says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That phrase, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, is the first phrase. The second phrase is found down in verse 15. And in verse 15, it says, this, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, I highlighted that, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom, now I underline this last part of it, you shine as lights in the world. So children of God that shine as lights in the world. That's the second phrase that I'm going to be looking at. And the last one is down in verse 18. It's, it says, as he closes this uh, paragraph uh, that we were reading, he says this, likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice. You also should be glad and rejoice. So those are the three phrases I'm going to be unpacking as we go through this. Now Paul is building this short section off of what I preached a couple of weeks back. So if you were with us, uh, hopefully you can remember that far back as to what we were talking about. But it was, it was chapter 2, we were talking about walking in humility, that reflecting the humility of Christ. And we saw that in that passage of chapter 2, we get this great view of who Christ is and how he humbled himself and came for us and died for us. But what I want us to be reminded of is verses 3 through 5, where he sets up that, that beautiful image of, of Christ. He, this is what he says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, the way you act, in humility, the way you live. Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind, a mind of Christ that is based on humility, among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So we can have that mind in Christ that he can help us walk after him and, and reflect that humility that comes from being in Christ to those around us. So we were looking at this idea of what it means to be humble a couple of weeks back. And Paul's building off of that. So he starts this with, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, he's talking about because of this idea of walking in humility, walking with God and reflecting Jesus in this way and, and having this view of who Christ is, let's look at these ideas. And so he's, he's has, he, uh, has us thinking about this. So humility is not thinking too highly of ourselves. It's, it's not being filled with arrogance or an unholy pride. 
It's, it's viewing others the way Christ uh, would have us to view them and, and keeping in, in our vision Christ who humbled himself for us. So verses 3 through 5 tell us that a Christian who has the mind of Jesus uh, counts others more significant than themselves and looks out for them, serving their needs. And so we were talking about serving the one. Who is the one you're serving? Who's the one you count more significant than yourself? Was it an individual? Was it a family? Or as a family, are you serving another family? Like we were asking those questions. And I hope over the last couple of weeks you've answered that question. Who is your one? Who is the person that you're sharing with, that you're serving, that you're showing Jesus to? I hope you have a definite name in mind when you think of that. So what we see out of this, a couple of verses here in two, is that actions follow the heart. So if we're considering others before ourselves, if we're thinking of the interests of others, that comes from an action that that spurs from the heart. What you do comes out of your heart. Think about that for a minute. Let's let it sit on you. So why did you do something this week or not do something this week that you should have? Why did you say the things that you said to others this week? It came from your heart. In Our actions follow our heart's condition. So to the degree that we don't act with the humility of chapter 2, to the degree that we don't act with the humility of Jesus is the degree of change that still needs to happen. And let's be honest, none of us have arrived. If you have, you're not humble. (laughs) I got it. But to the degree that we are lacking it reveals to us how much more transformation still needs to happen. How much more we still need to strive after Jesus and allow Him to be working in our heart. In Christ, He is doing this. He is changing us. And so, to, in this context of, of being uh, transformed, Paul says this to us, this first phrase, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He's not talking about earning your salvation. Paul's very clear that our salvation is by faith alone and Christ alone, not by works. We cannot boast. There's nothing that we can do to save ourselves. It's only done through what Christ has done for us on the cross and our coming and trusting him for what he has done. That's how we're saved. That's how our sins are forgiven at the cross. So when he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, he's not saying that all of a sudden we add works to the grace of Jesus at the cross to be saved. It's not works that he's talking about at all. What he's saying is, is that we're working in humility to apply the work of grace at the cross to our life. It's living the transformed life that comes from being saved. It's the application of salvation to your day-to-day living. You're working out that salvation as you go. You're being transformed. You're walking in it. It's not saving you. You've been saved by grace, and now you work out salvation as it's applied to your life. It's changing you. You're being transformed. So he says, work out your salvation. He says, walk in the newness of life that comes from being saved. So he says, work out your salvation. And then he adds this on the end of it with fear and trembling. Well, fear and trembling is understood with the next verse, verse 13, where he says this. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It's God working in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It means that we live a life in light of some of the things we've already read, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 6, where it says this to us, that 
He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It's knowing that He started this work in me. It's it's God working in my life and He started this good work when I came to Him by faith and was saved in Jesus Christ. He sealed me with that Holy Spirit and He began this good work in my life, a transformation of sanctification, of being made new. He's changing me, and he who began it is the one who will complete it. So I have this hope, this promise in in chapter 1, verse 6, that God began this work in my life so I can live in humility and live in these ways that reflect Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 5, we read this. We, We read, have this mind among yourselves, this mind of humility, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So humility in us is ours Because we're in Christ. We can't do this apart from Him. So being in Christ, now we can have a transformed heart that can can walk in the humility of Christ. That we can be like Him. So in Him, we can be transformed. He begins the work. He clothes us with His righteousness. In Him, He starts to change us. In verse 13, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. He works in us for his pleasure, for his purposes. He rejoices in it. It's his pleasure. It's for his good pleasure that we are being transformed and changed. That's that's an awesome thing, just to meditate on that. That in being in Christ and walking with him, he begins this work in me and he takes great joy in transforming me into the image of the Son. For His good pleasure, His good purposes. So living out our salvation with fear and trembling then means this. It means living a life, a new life, in which God is working before a sovereign and holy God with proper reverence. So we do have a role in this. God is working, but we have a role in in, in, in what we're doing. We're we're walking before him with fear and trembling. This idea of knowing the God in whom we are in front of. The God who is working in us. Giving him right reverence. He is sovereign of the universe. Holy, holy, holy God who who is jealous for his own glory. And I think sometimes we forget that. I think sometimes we forget the God who has redeemed us through the Son, Jesus Christ, who He really is. And we kind of bring Him down as a friend or a brother, which He is, but He is holy God. And so we're living in front of Him, this life. And Paul says it should be with fear and trembling, with the right reverence of knowing who this God is, who changes us. It's an amazing thing. Think about it for a minute. It is an amazing thing that we can stand before God and offer Him our worship. Knowing who God is. It is an amazing thing that we can gather together and stand before Him and offer Him worship. That we can come into this place together. And let's be honest. Let's just be honest here. At times, our hearts and our minds are far from God. At times, we come into this place and we're just thinking, yeah, I hope Rob's got a good one today and we're out by 12 because, you know, Pizza Ranch is right up the road after we're done. You're thinking about having to get maybe the car fixed because the windshield wipers quit working this week. Or maybe you're thinking about, I got to go to the grocery store and and get all those things done because Monday's coming and I got to get the kids ready and I got to get all this. Or maybe... If you've been like us, you're thinking, oh, we've had sickness in the house. I hope everybody's done with it now, and I hope we're all over the flu and stuff, and that's good. And, oh, we've got to disinfect everything this afternoon when we get home. I just want to rest. You know, maybe your, your mind gets distracted. And let's be honest, we've all been there. We've come into worship, and our hearts have not been here fully engaged with the God of the universe. And we come and we offer worship. Maybe we're listening to the music, and it's just like, you know what? I'm just not a singer. Just, just wait, you know. It's not my thing. Maybe that's, that's who we are. Maybe, <clears throat> maybe we, we don't like what I just did to you where I put you all praying together and, 
been praying with your neighbor or praying, and you're just like, I don't like praying out loud because someone's going to be hearing what I'm saying and I don't want them to hear what I'm saying because it doesn't always come out right. Like, I know what I mean in my heart and in my mind, but it doesn't always come out of my mouth. And, and I have that problem up here sometimes. And, you know, and, you know I'm just worried that someone's going to think these things about me. And you start thinking about what others around you are thinking about, about maybe what they're thinking about your voice or something like this while you're singing. And so you get caught up in these things that are just around us. And, and maybe you're even thinking, you know, I, I like worship because, you know, let me evaluate whether or not it was engaging for me or not or whatever, how this works. And we get caught up in these things and we forget that we're standing before holy, holy, holy God of the universe who created all things by the word of his mouth and by his power holds all things together in Christ. We forget we're standing in front of him and we offer this worship to him that's not even from a full heart committed to him at that moment. And he is worthy of that. He's jealous for his own glory and he's holy God and yet he allows us to come into his presence and, and I just, I gotta be honest, by his grace, he allows us to draw near and it's amazing to me at times just speaking about my own heart, my own self. It's amazing to, to me that at times when I'm done with worship, he hasn't just struck me dead because I offered him something that is not what he is worthy of. His grace is profound. His mercy is great. And he calls us into his presence and he has awesome patience and love for us. And in Christ, he makes a way that we can come and bring him our offering of worship. And Paul says, this is the God, keep this in mind, this is who you're serving. This is who is working in your life. This is who has reconciled you back to himself and calls you heirs with the Son, Christ Jesus. This is the God we serve. So work out your salvation. Live out that salvation before him with fear and trembling. Give him the reverence he deserves. Give him the honor that is his. Give him the glory because he alone is worthy of it. So Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So before we despair, because we're thinking, oh my gosh, like I, I can't do this, I want us to go back to 13 again. Let's look back again really quickly to 13, because here's hope, here's grace, here's the gospel applied to our hearts. For it is God, it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It's God who works. Oh, I am so thankful for that. He's not waiting for me to bring the perfect offering. He's working with me. He's transforming me. He's making my worship appropriate and acceptable because of Christ and the righteousness of Christ being applied. It's, it's Him working in me to will and to, and to do. That's hope. That's grace. God helps us. God works in us. John 15, 5 says this. This this is a passage I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Apart from me, without me, not in relationship with me, not reconciled to me, not in me, you can do nothing. So in Christ, Jesus says that we can bear much fruit. We can live this transformed life that we are being called into. But apart from him, no, we, we can't do anything. We're like the Pharisees who try in their own strength. We're whitewashed tombs, as the scripture says. We look good on the outside, but on the inside we're full of dead bones. Or you're like the bowl in my dishwasher this morning. <laughs> you ever wash the dishes? You know, you ask the kids, rinse the dishes before you put them in the dishwasher. And they're like, yeah, dad. And they look at it and they're like, just putting it in. Why do I have to wash it before we wash it? Am I right? You know, you get that and the kids do that. And so what do they do? They run it through the washer and you go to the dishwasher. And you're like, I'm going to get that bowl out. It's clean. I see the lights on. They did it. And you pick it up. And it's all nice and shiny on the outside. It's maybe a little warm. And you flip it over and it's got all this baked on crud on it. You're like, really? I told you to rinse this thing. You know, you're thinking about it. It's all on there. There it is. The outside looks good. 
But the inside, it's all baked on. Maybe it's that spaghetti from last week, you know, and that's the worst because then you've got to scrub it and really go to work on it. And it's, ah, uh, uh, it's the worst. Anyway, your life is like that. On the outside, you look good. Apart from Christ, you can make yourself look good. You can make yourself look clean. You can be nice and shiny. You can even be kind of warm to those around you. But on the inside, you got all this baked on crud. You're dirty. It's not acceptable. It's not pleasing. It's not what he wants. It's not being reconciled. It's not transformed. He says we can be changed in Christ. With Christ, we can bear much fruit. With Jesus, we can live as Scripture directs us to, and we can enjoy his presence. We can enjoy his presence and his power in our lives. We can enjoy having us with us, enjoy having him with us, so that takes me to the second phrase in, in verse 15. Let me read that to us. Verse 15, it says that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. I love living in the Midwest. Unless you go towards the cities, I mean, in the in the Summertime, when it's nice out, you can go out and it's dark, dark enough. It's not a lot of light. You can see the stars pretty well. Now, I've not been in a situation uh, like Bethany where uh, there was no lights. She was uh, serving up in Peru, or down in Peru, I should say, uh, one time. And she said, you know, it's so dark that you could see all the stars and all the constellations. You could just see everything. In fact, there were so many. She's like, it's hard to see them. Like, pick out the constellation was difficult because there's so many stars, you know? And it's, it's just beautiful. There's that sense like you can shine like lights in the world, like these stars. When we look at the night sky, when we look at the constellations, it, it's, it's amazing, right? But you know, depending on the season and the time, constellations move because the world's moving. And so depending on what, what season it is, depends on what kind of constellations are in the sky. But there's one that never moves, the North Star. And sailors looked at the North Star and they said, that's true north. It's over the pole. It never moves. It's always there. That was the first GPS. <laughs> that was it. So when you think about on star kids, it's really talking about the North Star. That's what the, that idea is. But it never moves. It never wavers and never varies. It's always there. So they knew where true north was. They could direct their direction, their lives or where they were going by that star. Listen, that's Christ for us as Christians. He is the true north. That's, we're directing our lives towards him. We're, we're moving towards him. He never wavers. He never varies. He's always there, consistently there for us. He is, he is our GPS. And Caleb, are you here? Are you singing GPS right now in your head? God's plan of salvation. I know you are, because I am. So it's God's plan of salvation. Jesus is our GPS. I know that's kitschy. Sorry. Had to go there. But we fix our lives on him. We fix our lives on him. And as we travel towards him, we're pointing others to him. They see the direction of where life is. Not that we are life. We're saying this is where life is. We're pointing to it, and we shine like north stars to the world around us. We are that pointing to true north. We are that life that points to the Savior, and we reflect him and his glory around us. So we shine brightly in a broken and crooked generation. We, we point others to Jesus. This is where I'm going to put in that other thing that came to me during our prayer time. We had a man, he said, it was early in the week, he said we were told to think about the promise of Abram and that it was for all nations and we should love, our God, we should love God, love our enemies, and love our neighbors. And So he was talking to a guy back in his village on cell phone and they were chatting and he said, you know, we, we need to love our enemies. We need to be praying for those people. We need to just love them. The next morning, he gets a call, and he shares with Stu this. He says, how do you love your enemy? 
when you tell your brother, go love your enemy, and you get a call the next day, and he says, my enemy just shot my brother in the head and killed him. Shining like stars is, is reconciling that. Is it still loving your enemy in the midst of that? And he says, I got to tell this guy, how do we love those who inflict this deepest pain on us? That's the reality these men were living in. That's, that's the world we live in. We're not apart from that. And so shining like stars means that we're walking after Jesus and we're pointing people to him, no matter the circumstances, no matter what's going on, we're pointing back to where real life is, this is the gospel hope we have in Jesus. So scripture's directing us how to live. Those, those rules that people complain about, and you know why people complain. It's like, I don't want to be a Christian because you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that. You know, they have those rules. You, you've met those people. I used to be one of those people. But it reveals something about God. Those, those rules reveal something about who he is and his character and, and who God is revealing to us and what we are to do in response to it. And so in this passage, he, we, we're told, be humble. Why? Because Christ was humbled for us. He, he is humble. Love others because Christ loves us. Obey because Christ obeyed the Father and came for us, so we obey. Live blameless because Christ is without sin. He is, he is not one to, that has blame on him. Live pure and innocent because Christ is holy. We see these things about who he is. It reveals who God is to us. When we think about why he asks us to live this way, it's because he wants us to know him. Think about your house and the rules you have. You make rules and the rules you make tell your kids something about you. <laughs> You're, now you're thinking, oh gosh, what are our rules? <laughs> and the kids are like, I can tell you the rules. You know, the rules we have say something about us, the rule maker. And when God says, this is life and this is how you live it, it tells us something about him. And he says, this is where life is found. And then here's the beautiful thing. He works in us and he invites us in to live as he is. To have his character, his qualities, him changing us. We are becoming more like the sun. And so we do this. We shine like stars in a dark world because others can see Jesus in our lives and they are affected by Jesus through our lives. They are transformed. Now, I have a friend, Colin. He loves flashlights. Oh my gosh. This guy goes online to buy flashlights, high-powered flashlights. And this guy loves them. And so we were at a corn maze once, and he had this little tiny flashlight. He got it from Japan, I think. And so we're, everybody has their flashlight out. It's, it's dark, and you're trying to find your way, right? And Colin, this guy's like 6'6 six, six or something. He's a big tall guy. Gets in the back of the group, raises his hand up really tall, and he turns on his little tiny flashlight, and it's just like, Boom. and everybody's like, whoa, where's that guy? You know, everyone's turning off their flashlight because it's, how much light is coming out of your life? I mean, that's what shining like stars is like for us. The more we're transformed and conformed, are you like a little match? Maybe there's a little light? Maybe your flashlight? When my friend Colin turns on his flashlight, it illuminates the path. It shows where we're going. And where we're going is to Jesus. And it shows others how to get there. But you're affected by it too. Let's be honest. If Colin takes that flashlight and shines it in your eyes, you're blind. You're done. It's, I mean, those things are crazy powerful. You will be affected by it. But we were affected by it because we could see in the moment when he turned it on. Your life should affect others around you. So how much are you shining? How much of your life has been transformed so that you can show people Christ? That's what Paul's talking about. And so we are changing because of Jesus, and we are shining like stars. And that brings us to this last phrase in 18, that you should be glad and rejoice. That you should be glad and rejoice. It starts in 17 where Paul's talking about being poured out for their faith, that he's pouring himself out for their faith. And, and for him, this is living out the great commandment and the great commission. The great commandment. Love God, love your neighbor, great commission. Go and teach them to observe all things. 
loving God, work out salvation with fear and trembling? How do you worship your God? You should work out your salvation with fear and trembling. How do you love your neighbor? Count others more significant than myself and look out for their interests. How do I teach them to observe all things? By shining like stars, living out all the things before them and with them. Walking with them in relationship. Daniel chapter 12 verse 3 says this, And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. We're leading people to the Savior. Leading the one. Who's your one? Who's that person that you're shining like a star in front of? Who are you leading to the Savior? Paul says doing this, leading others to Christ as we walk with Christ brings joy and rejoicing. Our joy is renewed as we serve. If you don't have joy, are you serving? If you're serving and your joy is gone, why? It renews. He's saying it should be renewed. And your joy should be made full because you should be rejoicing as well, seeing God at work, seeing God transform lives, not just yours, but others, and seeing Him do this awesome, mighty work that only Jesus can do. He says, we are full of joy and rejoicing. So let me ask three questions. The praise band, you can come on up. I, I don't want us to, to wait too long here because we're close on time, but praise band as you come up. I want us to consider these three questions. I wish I had a slide for you, but I don't. But pray about these things. I can't do this for you. You have to do this. Is, this is a part, the application today is you taking some time to be introspective, to think about your life and what this passage means. So how are you working out your salvation with fear and trembling? What does that look like? How bright is your life? How bright of a light are you? How are you shining before those around you? Here, Courtney. <laughs> are you a star? Are you Colin's flashlight? Are you Rob's flashlight? Are you a little match? What kind of light is your life giving off? And are you finding joy and serving others, considering them above yourself, looking out for their interests before your own? And if not, why? Ask God these questions and, and ask Him to show you what those next steps are, how you can serve Him with fear and trembling, love Him with fear and trembling, that your life would shine brightly and that you would find joy in the serve. Stand with me and we'll pray.